Hello, and in this video, I want to sort of bring to light all my research in regards to the history of cannabis ultimately becoming illegal. And it's a really fascinating history. I came across all this because in my research in regards to CBD, when you know all my patients started showing up and having so many questions, you go down the rabbit hole and you start coming across sort of a lot of this information historically. And so I wanted to just kind of compile all this in one video and present Present it to you uh, so that you have a better understanding of how controversial it actually all occurred. I'll start off by sort of laying out the scene of the time frame of when it occurred as well as talk about key individuals that had a major role in seeing cannabis ultimately becoming illegal and then sort of talk about some other real interesting facts that I feel like is worth sharing. So stay tuned and let's just jump straight in. <music> Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Dr. Jack, and on this channel, the focus is on helping you live a healthier, happier, and wiser life. And I want to wish everybody a happy holidays. With this video, I thought it would be important to kind of bring all of this to light, as I mentioned before. And the reason is that it's actually really fascinating. You know, a lot of people feel that ultimately marijuana becoming illegal was less about marijuana and much more about hemp. And before we go any further, one thing I do sort of want to discuss is sort of the nomenclature of cannabis versus marijuana versus hemp. You should realize that the words marijuana and hemp, they're not a way to define cannabis as a different species or strain or anything like that. It's just a nomenclature that basically has come up culturally. Uh, as it stands today, hemp is defined as less than 0.3% THC, whereas marijuana is defined as higher than that. Marijuana causes euphoria and a high. Hemp does not. And that is where most of the cannabinoids that are for health and wellness that I talk a lot about are mainly extracted from. Things like CBG, CBN, CBD, as well as you know a lot of the terpenes and flavonoids and all these things that I've covered in previous videos. Please check them out if you're so interested. One thing that I came across when I was kind of doing all this research and learning about cannabis overall is I was finding so many good studies and historical things that were talking about how amazing the plant is and how it has so many usages beyond even health and wellness. And you know, how did it ultimately end up being illegal? You had popular mechanics uh, way back uh, talking about how the plant has over 25,000 usages and how it will be the first billion dollar crop. You could even date it back to 16 19, where it was actually written in Virginia law that every farmer had to grow hemp uh, because of its many, many usages. And it was actually used as a form of currency in Virginia, as well as in uh, other states such as Maryland and Pennsylvania. So how did we get from all of that to ultimately having this crop be illegal? And it's actually really fascinating. So let's just jump straight into it. It's early 1930s and the Mexican Revolution War uh, was just ending. Uh, it was fought between 1910 and 1920. And you also have alcohol prohibition coming to a close uh, at 1933. And we are in the midst of the Great Depression. So jobs are scarce and you have a big influx um, historically recently of migrant workers from Mexico who were basically escaping uh, the Revolutionary War that was being fought in their country. And there was a lot of tension in the air, if you will, uh, about sort of jobs and, you know, migrant workers taking jobs. And it's the 1930s, right? So, I mean, there's quite a bit of racism at the time too. And I just need to sort of set the stage because um, we're going to next kind of dive into a theoretical uh, meeting that took place at that time between five wealthy, very powerful people of the time and how they basically had a hand in making cannabis illegal. So picture a nice spring day and the most powerful people in the world at this time are about to meet on this very nice, beautiful mansion on a hill. And in walks the first individual who introduced himself. His name is William Randolph Hearst. Hello. 
I am William Hurst and I am a media mogul. There is no other bigger media conglomerate at this time than myself. I run newspapers and magazines and I would also like to add that I am uh, quite racist. I want to be here at this meeting today because I have invested a lot of money in the timber industry uh, for the paper pulp to run my newspapers and magazines and I have a lot of finances tied up there and I don't know if you guys have heard, but recently they came out with a new machine that, that decorticates the hemp plant and removes the fiber from the stalk of the plant in a very efficient manner. And the pulp that is made from that to essentially make paper is really threatening my industry. And whatever we decide to do here today, you know, being in charge of the media, we can control the narrative and basically go from there. Then in walks, Andrew Mellon. Hello, I am Andrew Mellon and I am the U.S. Secretary of Treasury. I am also the majority stakeholder in Gulf Oil, uh, which in the future, many decades from now, maybe we'll name it Chevron Oil. I also have various investments in the pharmaceutical world and I also financially back the individual you just met. Then next in walks Lamont DuPont. I'm Lamont DuPont and I am the founder of DuPont Corporation Petrochemicals. I hold a lot of patents in synthetic fibers as well as derivatives that are made from oil. And so I have a vested interest in oil as well as my friend Andrew Mellon, who actually financially backs my company up as well. And hemp ethanol fuel is threatening the industry and along with my synthetic fiber patents as well it's because of again the fiber that is extracted from the stalk of the hemp plant and then in walks harry j anslinger hello my name is Harry J. Anslinger, and my wife's uncle is actually Andrew Mellon, who you just met. I am currently the director of the Bureau of Alcohol Prohibition. As you all know, alcohol prohibition is coming to an end, and I am looking for a new public enemy, number one. Therefore, I think marijuana will be the perfect target for this. In fact, I plan on spearheading this entire campaign, and I feel that I could do such a good job of it that I will be in charge of this new division for the next three decades, as well as ultimately be a U.S. representative to the United Nations and take the fight against cannabis on a more of a world stage. And then the other two players that are very interesting at that time period are um, Dale Carnegie, as well as John D. Rockefeller. Uh, what you should know about them is that they were very heavily invested in the pharmaceutical world, and they actually did a lot of investments together. Rockefeller actually is actually the head of Standard Oil and Company as well. And so at one point, um, Standard Oil and Company actually controlled two-thirds of the world's oil and 95% of the United States oil. And he was also heavily invested in the steel industry, actually several of these um, individuals were. One thing you should know that Henry Ford built a automobile that was actually, the entire car was made from hemp and ran on um, hemp fuel as well and biofuel. And uh, it was shown to be quite durable and there was actually a Forbes magazine article that mentions how, you know, imagine a sweater softer than any fabric you've ever felt before and more durable than cotton. Imagine a car built with something lighter than steel that could stand 10 times the impact without denting. And imagine if you could save four acres of trees by making paper from a single acre of a rapid growing plant. And now imagine all of this is possible, but you cannot do it because of its scorned cousin named marijuana. So as you can see, during this time period, there were many individuals, very wealthy and powerful individuals, who were highly self-motivated to basically see the end of cannabis because it threatened so much of their industry. You know, you had William Hurst, who was really in charge of the media and the narrative from that angle and sort of answering or spearheading this whole, this whole thing and a lot of financial backing uh, to see this through, basically. So it ultimately led to a crazy film um, called Reefer Madness. And if in that film, if you watch it, they talk about how if you smoke marijuana, you become this murderer, rapist, uh, suicidal, um, as well as become very, very promiscuous and all these things. And uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. If you look at it in regards to the conversations that were had at the time, it was all so it was also quite racially motivated as well. And again, given the time frame and 
everything that I was sort of discussing leading up to this. At the time, marijuana was mainly being used by Mexican migrant workers as well as the black jazz community, entertainers and, you know, hipsters and these individuals were targeted. So slowly the public's opinion was slowly changed and actually a lot of people didn't even really associate marijuana with hemp or think that they were related um, or even related to cannabis. Uh, it seems that marijuana and the word cannabis sort of became synonymous, but um, hemp really was not. Actually at a 1930s um, congressional hearing, many of the senators afterward that ended up voting at the time or you know speaking about it actually were interviewed and having even said that they had no idea that you know, they were talking about hemp as well. They simply did not know the difference between hemp and marijuana, uh, much like how a lot of people even today still sort of do not know the differences between the two. And at the time, the US Pharmacopeia actually even listed cannabis as having over a hundred usages for various ailments. And the American Medical Association or the AMA was actually uh, very much opposed to ultimately what came out and that was the Marijuana Tax Act, which taxed marijuana and all cannabis very, very heavily and ultimately ended the usage of cannabis in all its forms. And another interesting fact is that the Marijuana Tax Act was actually briefly lifted back in 1940s during World War II. And there was a film that was released in 1942 called Hemp for Victory by the US government. And they were handing out hemp seeds to farmers and wanted them to grow it because of the importance of the fiber from the stock of the uh, cannabis plant and how it's used to make things like parachutes and cordage and shoelaces for soldier shoes and uh, ropes for ships and uh, all sorts of usages. And so it was briefly lifted and then when the war ended, um, the Marijuana Tax Act went back into effect. And throughout history, there were several physicians and scientists and people that basically tried to bring awareness of just how wrong the information that many of the politicians were being presented, but they were always sort of shot down by this theory known as the stepping stone theory that was, uh, again, mainly made popular by Harry J. Anslinger. And the stepping stone theory is basically what we would call today the gateway drug theory. And he was telling the world that basically 50% of people that use marijuana ultimately go on and use heroin, which obviously is not true. And so anytime people try to bring up things about the health or medical and wellness benefits of the cannabis plant, it was always shot down by using that excuse. This ultimately culminated in uh, the Boggs Act, uh, and you can get up to 10 years in prison for using marijuana, and there was also heavy fines. And this all continued ultimately into until about 1960s when there was sort of a cultural and political shift going on, you know, with the um, hippies and flower power and all these things and the attitude towards cannabis uh, started to change around that time period. Another interesting fact that I stumbled upon in my research is uh, if you get a chance, you can look up the Abraham Flexner report. It was basically started by the uh, Carnegie Foundation and had funding by Rockefeller as well. And what the Flexner report did was basically Abraham Flexner went across the country to essentially standardize medical care and medical education. At that time, there was essentially medicine um, in the United States was more of alternative medicine, if you will. There was a lot of um, naturopaths and homeopathic medicine and things like that, you know, herbal treatments. And, you know, there, the Flexner Report, it did do a lot of good because it did sort of standardize uh, medical education because there were, um, you know, people out there that were not well educated and charlatans and things like that. But out of the Flexner Report, that is when the era of medical training where you get a quote pill for an ill, where everything can be treated, you know, with some type of pharmaceutical drug as opposed to some sort of natural remedy or something like that. And I think it's fascinating that the people that launched the beginnings of that report were also heavily um, invested in the pharmaceutical world as well.
So, you know, one thought that I kept having in my head when I was researching all of this was that the amazing durability and flexibility of the cannabis plant and its tens of thousands of usages that it can be applied for, I really wonder what the world would look like from more of a environmental standpoint if cannabis never became illegal. And, you know, I think that the deforestation as well as you know, things like oil spills and all the plastics that we see in the world, all of that would look uh, quite different um, today had the cannabis plant not been made illegal many decades ago. And that basically sums it all up. So I hope you guys found this entertaining and I ask that you please like, subscribe, as well as hit that notification bell so you know when my next videos will pop up. These videos take quite a bit of time to do. So by doing all that, you're really helping support the channel and I'd greatly appreciate that. I post weekly and please put comments down below. I'm very good about answering those. And again, I'd like to wish you and your families a safe and happy holidays. By this time next year, hopefully this whole coronavirus deal would have been behind us. Um, you know, I did the videos on the vaccine and hopefully I'll be getting mine soon here. But until uh, next time, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Pura Vida.